I'm, as you can see, from Randolph University and over there at the CLS, the Center for Language Studies, we have a, a so-called colloquium each month or almost each month where uh, language researchers present their, their work. And um, uh, last year, uh, I, you could take that for credit, so I did that and then you have to write a paper. And uh, the title of this presentation is the same as the title of the paper. Uh, which is about the lecture that uh, Dr. Alton, who is here, uh, held. This is him, he's also here. Uh, and his uh, lecture or his presentation was about. Uh, can you all hear me, by the way? Am I not speaking? To okay. Um, the uh, iconicity in uh, Dutch uh, verb vowels. Um, and um, he. Uh, focuses on one particular uh, uh, group of vowels, the so-called group four uh, verbs. Uh, so you have uh, different vowels in verb roots, uh, short vowels is one, long vowels and uh, diphthongs, and then there's these group four, uh, which is a combination of a long vowel and a short closed vowel, so e or u. Some linguists also analyze this as a, as a glide, but it doesn't matter. Um, and, and his idea uh, was, if I formulate it correctly, that these uh, vowels are iconic of uh, some kind of curved or round movement. And uh, on the next slide, I have a couple examples of what he means by that. So uh, this is just from uh, googling these words and then seeing what kind of pictures you get. You so you have words like zwaaien, graaien, paaien, draaien, snaaien, strooien, plooien, looien, spoeien, boeien, roeien, stoeien, geeuwen, schreeuwen. And if you read them all out like that, it sounds almost like a poem by the late great Jules Diller, who so sadly passed away last month. Uh, but uh, yeah, you can maybe see uh, what he means by round movement, right? If you if you look at these. <coughs> of course, these are, these are still pictures, but you can kind of see the, the, the motion. Now, uh, and he um, discusses this iconicity and its possible origins from three theoretical frameworks. So the, the first of those is direct iconic resemblance. That's uh, the idea that the, the sound of a word uh, directly stands for what it means, uh, like in onomatopoeia, like the word woof sounds like the bark of a dog, and that is already found in uh, Humboldt. And um, uh, the other one is uh, phonus themes, we will get to that in, in more detail, but it's essentially um, the idea that certain combinations of sound can come to stand semantically um, for a meaning, so not through direct iconicity, but through a longer process of development. And then finally, there is a mouth gesture theory, which is the idea that the movements of the mouth mimic the movements of the hands and maybe the body, and uh, as a result, you get uh, a sound. Um, so uh, what I did in this paper was uh, basically two things. Uh, first of all, I suggest that these uh, movements that uh, Foma claims that these verbs are iconic of are not so much round or curved movements, but most prototypically what I would call uh, uh, oscillating. So um, it goes out from a center and then in all directions and back. So you can sort of see here with the... Do I have this laser? Does that work? Yes, okay, so here with Spruje, uh, for example, it goes out from the center and then in all directions, and sometimes these things also go round, and also with Strooien, uh, Zwaaien, the head is in the middle, goes to one side, back to the middle, to the other side, and back, and so on. And so I suggest that that is the most prototypical uh, uh, movement that this is iconic of, and that the other uh, uh, more general round movements and so on developed from that through a sort of semantic widening. Uh, 
And uh, then, of course, you can say, yeah, but the, the, the reverse is also possible, and I have some arguments why I think that's not the case. So um, I was talking, oh, whoops. I was talking about what I did in the paper. So the, the first thing is I uh, developed an experiment uh, for how we can test whether it is really, uh, as I claim, oscillating movement or as uh, Foreman claims, uh, curved or round movement. Um, and the second thing is, uh, regardless of what the iconicity is precisely, I uh, dig into the mechanism by which such an iconicity could have developed. So uh, here's a brief look at the experiment. Sorry, I had to draw this by hand because I had no time to do nice animations. Um, the idea is basically that you have uh, fictional abstract shapes. I use triangles here to represent them, but they, they can be anything as long as, as it's not itself round. And then you have, you have to make different movements. So you have, these are just movements that are round. And then you have a sort of spiral movement or something like this. Uh, something that oscillates, you can make any kind of bizarre movements and uh, and then there are uh, pseudo words that look like Dutch verbs and here you have something like this which has to group four the vowels in the root and here you have uh, the other kinds and then uh, there are two parts to the experiment so uh, the first part is you show the two movements, one of each of these and one uh, word and you ask them to match the word to a movement and the other one is the other way around so you you show them two words one of each of these groups and then you ask them uh, and you show them one movement and you ask them to match the movement to the word so and then the prediction is that if or the idea the hypothesis is that if you uh, both of these associations are significant in one direction then that means that something is really going on here so if anyone wants to do this experiment i could do it myself of course um, uh, but you can also do it, I mean they say that academia is very competitive but I'm not a very competitive person so if anybody wants to do this uh, that's fine, just make sure to cite my paper uh, or you can do it together with me, just talk to me after this. Um, anyway, that's, that's the, the, the one thing and the other thing uh, is a little more complicated so let me uh, try to explain this to you. Uh, so I, I analyze uh, his uh, idea from all the three theoretical uh, viewpoints. So, um, first of all, um, the, um, the direct iconicity framework. So, um, this is kind of similar, as I already said, to um, uh, onomatopoeia and other uh, examples of what Martin Dingemans calls depiction, so uh, what you also find in idiophones, for example. Uh, but um, the problem is this is a little too vague. For example, uh, Humboldt gives the example of uh, the, the sequence in German, which uh, um, at the onset of words he says uh, connotes a sort of firmness. So you can imagine words like stehen, stock. Stutz, Staat, and so on, and that gives the impression of something that's rigid and firm, and you can kind of hear where that comes from, but uh, there's no reason why it couldn't be, for instance, or or something like that. So um, uh, that is not, uh, it is not really, uh, there's not really any specific reason why any particular sequence of phonemes should uh, go with a certain meaning. And also some of those words may be etymologically related and, uh, you know, and there's also, uh, you can also always think of counterexamples where this doesn't hold. So this is too vague. There is no uh, inherent sound symbolism, <coughs> which uh, Firth in reviewing uh, Humboldt also says. And yet when you hear that, you get the, the impression that there has to be something to it somehow. So... Um, that is where the other framework comes in, that of uh, phonostemes. So the idea of a phonosteme is a, a sequence of sounds that uh, patterns together in words with related meanings. And uh, uh, Firth already mentions this, but there's also someone named Willett who uh, wrote his uh, dissertation on phonostemes. And, um, and for example, um, he mentions how in the poem Jabberwocky by Lewis Carroll, maybe you know it, you have this word slippy, 
which means nothing. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's not a word, but it does mean something, and you can kind of understand what it means because there is also these other words that start with sol, like slimy, slazy, slag, sloven, slippery. And they all have this sort of connotation of unpleasantness or unsavoriness or uh, something like that. And uh, what Willett says is that you can. This kind of uh, uh, pattern can develop just by chance. Um, so, w at some point, you have a number of words that just happen to have this this sequence, um, and um, once you have enough of them, the it sort of the pattern begins to cluster together. And uh, yeah, that is a nice example of uh, uh, a mechanism that I often find in, in language, but also in human cognition in general, that everything is a, a frequency effect, for which we also saw some indications just now. And, um, uh, but he also uh, says that these, these uh, phonostemic patterns can develop from something that is originally iconic, and, and Fallen in his presentation also said that. Um, and um, this is uh, this reminds me of um, uh, this is reminiscent of what uh, Hiraga and others call a diagrammatic iconicity. So that is a um, a relation between form and meaning, where the uh, sameness in form uh, signals or signifies sameness in meaning. Um, uh, right, so, uh, but then, uh, is this enough to explain the whole thing? What about that, that third framework, the one of mouth gesture theory? Um, in mouth gesture theory, uh, the, the mouth movements go along with the hand movements. So, um, and there is actually evidence that uh, um, the, the motor articulation, the, I'm sorry, the articulatory motor planning, and the planning of the movements of the fingers and hands are uh, happening in the same area of the brain. Um, so, um, and there are linguists who uh, say that at the origin of language is gesture, and that then people started doing things first with their hands, and then through this mechanism, the motion of the mouth mimics that of the hand, and that's how you get these iconic sounds. Um, but this has been mostly discredited by now. But anyway, um, um, uh, there are there have been studies that show, for example, this one by Otaka and Haru, uh, which show that if you have just the the movement of the mouth without the sound, you don't get this this uh, iconicity, and or uh, people are not better at guessing which which sound goes with, with meaning. And therefore, they argue that it is uh, rather uh, the the physical property of the sound that uh, is behind this. And then I thought, well, yeah, but if you make the sound, you also always make the mouth movement because you you have to, right? So, and then if it's the same brain area, that would also uh, go together with the hand movement. So here. I apologize for the people who don't enjoy looking at pictures of brains. I figured to make it more scientific, I need to include one slide with pictures of brains. <laughs> so this area here, this is called uh, premotor area five. This is in a, a monkey brain, and in the human brain, this corresponds to Broadman's area 44. This is a part of Broca's area. Apparently, um, this is where the uh, both grasping hands movement and articulatory mouth movements are planned and it is suggested that this uh, is uh, results from planning for self-feeding so you, you grab the food with your hand and then you also open your mouth to put the food in uh, but um, whatever um, yeah in such a way uh, um, you get the, the, the movement of the mouth that sort of points to the, the movement of the hand in, in semiotics that is called, I don't know if you're familiar with Peirce in semiotics, but that is called an index. And then through this, this phonostemic mechanism, such an index can develop into an icon or even a symbol. Um, now, uh, here's another example of this happening in real time, more or less. This is a, um, 
for the people who have no idea what they're looking at right now, this this dog in the middle here is called Dove, and that's a dog that shows up a lot in the internet memes. I think this is a Shiba Inu, not sure. And um, around this dog, there are other dogs of various kinds, and they're arranged in this um, this pattern of the three different dimensions, and that uh, depends at least in first instance on the sound they make. So here we have borkers, down here we have yippers, and here woofers. Now these words are clearly um, uh, iconic, right? They are onomatopoeic. But then, in the middle between these dogs, you have boofers, yorkers, yoofers, and as you can see, at least that's how I interpret it, uh, this is not sound uh, iconicity anymore. This is uh, because, uh, for example, this uh, dog is not a dog that says York. It's just a, a dog that is roughly in between borkers and yippers in terms of the shape of the nose and the, the hair and the shape of the eyes and uh, ears and so on. So, what language is this? English? This is supposed to be English, but this is on the internet, so it's internet. <laughs> and, um, so what, what's happening here, as I see it, is that you have something that was originally sound iconic, that uh, these, these uh, phonemes or combinations of phonemes come to stand semantically for the dog itself, not just for the sound. And then, uh, you know, maybe uh, this pattern will continue diachronically and in a few years you'll have whippers and bippers and God knows what. So, um, uh, finally, uh, there's not really a, a, a take home message um, because what I wanted to show to you was this, this mechanism which is hard to uh, summarize in one or two sentences but if you want a, a more uh, solid conclusion you should read the paper. Uh, uh, but it's nice to end with a few suggestions for future research. So uh, there has been uh, some work done um, by our own Mark Dingemanswe and also by uh, Simon Kirby and his colleagues on the role of iconicity in language evolution. Um, and I hope to be working soon on, under Mark's supervision on something about how you have these uh, circumstances like uh, social and cultural circumstances and also cognitive circumstances uh, driving the evolution of language um, and that leads to how maybe some languages become more iconic have more iconic words than others and then how does that work that is uh, what I'd like to write about now before I finish the presentation I would uh, like to quickly say a word of thanks to a friend of mine who's not here Paul Zwevenig uh, it was thanks to his uh, contribution that I was even able to attend today because as a student who has been studying without study finance for uh, the last few months and who is also not a member of the ANELA or the AVT, the uh, registration fee of 50 euros was prohibitively high. So uh, thanks, uh, Paul. Uh, now, if you want to know more about me, you can go to my website, jbrownswebsite.com. There you can read my other academic work. Um, here's a bunch of references. Uh, the actual paper has more references than these, so please read that. Um, that's been it. Thank you. Thank you.